What are the rights of women in Islam? Question. What are the rights of women like under Islam, and how have they changed since Islam's golden age from mid-8th century until 12th century, if they have changed? Summary of answer. Islam raised the status of women, and made them equal with men in most rulings. So women, like men, are commanded to believe in Allah and to worship Him. And women are made equal to men in terms of reward in the hereafter. Women have the right to express themselves, to give sincere advice, to enjoin what is good and forbid what is evil, and to call people to Allah. Women have the right to own property, to buy and sell, to inherit, to give charity and to give gifts. It is not permissible for anyone to take a woman's wealth without her consent. For more about the rights of women in Islam, see the detailed answer. Praise be to Allah. Islam honors women as mothers. Islam honors women greatly. It honors women as mothers who must be respected, obeyed and treated with kindness. Pleasing one's mother is regarded as part of pleasing Allah. Islam tells us that paradise lies at the mother's feet, that is that the best way to reach paradise is through one's mother. And Islam forbids disobeying one's mother or making her angry, even by saying a mild word of disrespect. The mother's rights are greater than those of the father, and the duty to take care of her grows greater as the mother grows older and weaker. Honoring parents in the Quran. All of that is mentioned in many texts of the Quran and Sunnah prophetic traditions. For example, Allah says, Interpretation of the Meaning. And we have enjoined on man to be dutiful and kind to his parents. al 46, 15. And your Lord has decreed that you worship none but him. And that you be dutiful to your parents. If one of them or both of them attain old age in your life, say not to them a word of disrespect, nor shout at them but address them in terms of honor. And lower unto them the wing of submission and humility through mercy, and say, My Lord. Bestow on them your mercy as they did bring me up when I was young. al 17:23, 24. Honoring parents in the sunnah. Ibn Majah, 2781, narrated that Muawiyah ibn Ju'amir al-Salami, may Allah be pleased with him, said, I came to the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, and said, O Messenger of Allah, I want to go for jihad, battle, with you, seeking thereby the face of Allah in the hereafter. He said, Woe to you! Is your mother still alive? I said, Yes. He said, Go back and honor her. Then I approached him from the other side and said, O Messenger of Allah, I want to go for jihad with you, seeking thereby the face of Allah in the hereafter. He said, Woe to you! Is your mother still alive? I said, Yes. He said, Go back and honor her. Then I approached him from in front and said, O Messenger of Allah, I want to go for jihad with you, seeking thereby the face of Allah in the hereafter. He said, Woe to you! Is your mother still alive? I said, Yes. He said, Go back and honor her, lit. Stay by her feet, for there is paradise. Classed as Sahih by Allah Bani in Sahih Sunan ibn Majah. It was also narrated by al nazai with the words, Stay with her for paradise is beneath her feet. Al Bukhari 5971 and Muslim 2548 narrated that Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him, said, A man came to the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, and said, O Messenger of Allah, who is most deserving of my good company? He said, Your mother. He said, Then who? He said, your mother. He said, then who? He said, your mother. He said, then who? He said, then your father. And there are other texts which we do not have room to mention here. Obligation on sons to spend on their mothers. One of the rights which Islam gives to the mother is that her son should spend on her if she needs that support, so long as he is able and can afford it. Hence for many centuries it was unheard of among the people of Islam for a mother to be left in an old people's home or for a son to kick her out of the house or for her sons to refuse to spend on her, or for her to need to work in order to eat and drink if her sons were present. Islam honors women as wives. Islam urges the husband to treat his wife in a good and kind manner, and says that the wife has rights over the husband like his rights over her, except that he is a degree over her. Because of his responsibility of spending and taking care of the family's affairs. Islam states that the best of the Muslim men is the one who treats his wife in the best manner, and the man is forbidden to take his wife's money without her consent. Allah says, interpretation of the meaning. And live with them honorably, al Nizah 419. And they, women, have rights similar to those of their husbands over them to what is reasonable, but men have a degree of responsibility over them. And Allah is almighty, or wise, al-Baqarah 2, 228. And the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, I urge you to treat women well. Narrated by al Bukhari, 331. Muslim, 1468. And the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, 
The best of you is the one who is best to his wife, and I am the best of you to my wives. Narrated by Altamiti, 3895. Ibn Majah, 1977. Classed as Sahib al Albani in Sahih Altamiti. Islam honors women as daughters. And Islam honors women as daughters, and encourages us to raise them well and educate them. Islam states that raising daughters will bring a great reward. For example, the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, Whoever takes care of two girls until they reach adulthood, he and I will come like this on the day of resurrection, and he held his fingers together. Narrated by Muslim, 2631. Ibn Majah, 3669, narrated that Yuqba ibn Amir, may Allah be pleased with him, said, I heard the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, say, Whoever has three daughters, and is patient towards them, and feeds them, gives them to drink and clothes them from his riches, they will be a shield for him from the fire on the day of resurrection. Classed as Sahib by Allah Bani and Sahib ibn Majah. Islam honors women as sisters and aunts. Islam honors women as sisters and as aunts. Islam enjoins upholding the ties of kinship and forbids severing those ties in many texts. The Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, O people, spread the greeting of Salaam, offer food to the needy, uphold the ties of kinship, and pray at night when people are sleeping, and you will enter paradise in peace. Narrated by Ibn Majah, 3251. Classed as Sahih by Allah Bani and Sahih Ibn Majah. Al Bukhari 5988 narrated that the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, Allah, may he be exalted, said to the ties of kinship. Whoever upholds you, I will support him, and whoever breaks you, I will cut him off. All of these qualities may coexist in a single woman, she may be a wife, a daughter, a mother, a sister, an aunt, so she may be honored in all these ways. Women enjoy these rights in Islam. To conclude, Islam raised the status of women, and made them equal with men in most rulings. So women, like men, are commanded to believe in Allah and to worship Him. And women are made equal to men in terms of reward in the hereafter. Women have the right to express themselves, to give sincere advice, to enjoin what is good and forbid what is evil, and to call people to Allah. Women have the right to own property, to buy and sell, to inherit, to give charity and to give gifts. It is not permissible for anyone to take a woman's wealth without her consent. Women have the right to a decent life, without facing aggression or being wronged. Women have the right to be educated. In fact it is obligatory to teach them what they need to know about their religion. Anyone who compares the rights of women in Islam with their situation during the Jaliyya, pre-Islamic days of ignorance, or in other civilizations will understand that what we are saying is true. In fact we are certain that women are given the greatest honor in Islam. Rights of women in other civilizations. There is no need for us to mention the situation of women in Greek, Persian or Jewish society, but even Christian societies had a bad attitude towards women. The theologians even gathered at the Council of Macon to discuss whether a woman was merely a body or a body with a soul. They thought it most likely that women did not have a soul that could be saved, and they made an exception only in the case of Mary, Maryam, peace be upon her. The French held a conference in 586 CE to discuss whether women had souls or not, and if they had souls, were these souls animal or human? In the end, they decided that they were human. But they were created to serve men only. During the time of Henry VIII, the English Parliament issued a decree forbidding women to read the New Testament, because they were regarded as impure. Until 1805, English law allowed a man to sell his wife, and set a wife's price at six pennies. In the modern age, women were kicked out of the house at the age of 18 so that they could start working to earn a buy to it. If a woman wanted to stay in the house, she had to pay her parents rent for her room and pay for her food and laundry. See Audit Al-Hijab, 2, 47-56. How can we compare this to Islam, which enjoins honoring and kind treatment of women, and spending on them? Have the rights of women in Islam been neglected? With regard to the changes in these rights throughout the ages, the basic principles have not changed, but with regard to the application of these principles, there can be no doubt that during the Golden Age of Islam, the Muslims applied the Sharia Islamic law of their Lord more. And the rulings of this Sharia include honoring one's mother and treating one's wife, daughter, sister and women in general in a kind manner. The weaker religious commitment grew, the more these rights were neglected. But until the day of resurrection there will continue to be a group who adheres to their religion and applies the Sharia laws of their Lord. These are the people who honor women the most and grant them their rights. Despite the weakness of religious commitment among many Muslims nowadays, women still enjoy high status, whether as daughters, wives or sisters, whilst we acknowledge that there are shortcomings.
wrongdoing and neglect of women's rights among some people, but each one will be answerable for himself. And Allah knows best. Women's rights in Islam, etc. Question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May God bless you in everything and in anything. Please give an extensive and detailed answer to a question posed by right-wing academia to Muslim scholars and thinkers. 1. Do Western countries give more rights to women than Muslim countries? How come or why and why not? 2. In the last 1,000 years or so, what has Islam contributed to humanity and civilization? Inventions, politically, socially and scientifically. Answer. Prior to comparing the rights of women in Muslim and non-Muslim countries, it is imperative to first to find the term rights. The most fundamental issue in this regard is that in recognizing his right, the Muslim first acknowledges that he is to obey the law of his Creator. Hence the things that which Allah has made permissible for men are his rights and the things which Allah has prohibited are not his rights. On the contrary present-day secular non-Muslims regard fulfillments of one's desires as a right even though religion or civic society disapproves, provided that no other person or animal is harmed in the process. It is for this reason that they condone homosexual marriages, nudity in public, fulfillments of sexual desires in public, women having extramarital relationships etc. under the pretext of women's rights. In view of the grave and fundamental differences between the Muslim and non-Muslim definitions of rights, can we still compare the rights and freedom in Muslim and non-Muslim countries? This contemporary non-Muslim definition of rights is illogical. That is why 100 years ago these very same rights were illegal. If these rights are logical, wouldn't it mean that 100 years ago their rulers and their legal fraternity were all fools? There wasn't a single thinker and scholar among them? For further reference check Fari Abdamadun by Ikramula. Islam also gave women certain basic human rights. However, together with these rights, Islam has also put certain restrictions in place to maintain a sound society in which man doesn't behave like animals. And contrary to the understanding of many people, these restrictions are not confined to women only, there are restrictions for the men too. A man cannot marry just any woman he desires, he cannot have sexual relations with any woman besides his wife. And neither can he use his wife's wealth without her permission, nor can he treat her wealth as his. In short, when giving men and women certain rights, Islam also places certain restrictions according to their physical natures, strengths and tendencies. More so, a person who ponders with an unbiased mind will realize that all these restrictions are totally logical. The rights enjoyed in non-Muslim countries also have certain restrictions. The question of wearing a specific uniform in school, government and private institutes, the army, the defense force etc. is just one example. Similarly, while some activities are not permitted, others have to be completed within a particular time. If there are absolutely no restrictions in these countries, why would they still have a constitution, courts, judges? police, prisons etc. The animals that are the freest creation who observe no restrictions whatsoever when fulfilling their desires. Are there any courts, judges and police in the jungle? Islam gave women certain natural rights and set some rules for this. For example, she is entitled to live in dignity, entitled to possess her own wealth, she can earn and spend her own wealth, she is permitted to marry the person of her choice. She can request her husband for tulak, she can travel, she can work in various departments. She can study, teach, vote etc. Thus despite certain restrictions she has freedom in all these areas. Islam blessed women with the noble titles of mother, sister, daughter, auntie etc. and prohibited man from fulfilling their desires with above relatives. Our question is that does secularism condone marriage of a man to his mother, sister, daughter etc.? If not, then on what grounds? Is a man's freedom not curtailed when he is restricted from marrying his mother, sister, daughter etc.? On the other hand if such marriages are permissible, would secularism not be reducing women to a mere object of sex? If there is no sexual attraction in her, she is not respected even though she may be a mother, sister, or daughter. This explains why aged women in non-Muslim countries are facing some very frightening conditions. You probably have more knowledge than us in this regard. Islam has not burdened women with any financial responsibilities. Her expenses are the responsibility of her father, husband and brother. In fact there are some instances wherein a woman can claim a monetary remuneration for wet nursing and looking after the children. On the contrary, in order for a woman to lead a dignified life in Western society she is obliged to go out and earn. It is quite evident from newspaper and magazine articles and various other surveys that by large women in such countries are facing great difficulties their conditions are pitiable. 150 years ago women in non-Muslim countries were oppressed to the extent that they never even enjoyed basic human rights. When many men were killed in the First and Second World War thus causing a huge shortage in manpower. 
women were given certain rights and then brought into the workforce in order to rectify the deteriorating economy. Consequently women began making money their primary objective in life. For this they searched for the easiest possible method. Hence some reports show that the highest income group in America or is the fashion models. Such freedom, however, spreads indecency and destroys society and is therefore prohibited in Islam. The primary difference between the Muslim and non-Muslim society is that while the Muslim society is bound to religious law, the non-Muslim society recognizes no restrictions. Thus things that the Muslim society may disdain and view with disgust are regarded as art in a non-Muslim society. Therefore there cannot be any similarity between the rights in these totally different societies. A Muslim lady who observes the laws of Islam regards herself as secure and comfortable. She happily accepts the restrictions imposed on her because she believes that, that is how she can please her creator, be respected in society and be blessed with a pleasant life after death. Non-Muslim women, however, do not share the same feelings. They have no concern about the hereafter and pleasing their creator. Thus they hate the restrictions which we are referring to and regard them as a curtailment of their rights. When Lady Diana married Prince Charles she was forced to observe the etiquette of the royal family. Hence she has to stop her relationship with her old friends. This annoyed her to the extent that the marriage eventually collapsed. The result of the differences in the religion's outlook of Muslim and non-Muslim women is that Muslim women in a Muslim society do not demand any rights because they already have them. On the contrary non-Muslim continuously make newer demands in order to compete with the men. It is only recently that women in non-Muslim countries receive their rights. Muslim women, however, received their rights 1425 years ago. As far as those Muslim countries are concerned who do not give the women their rights, their rulers are to blame for this. It is not the fault of Islam. Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings of Allah be upon him had on various stages commanded us to be kind to women and to fulfill their needs. Thus he peace and blessings of Allah be upon him said. The best amongst you is he who is best to his wife and children. Even on his deathbed he peace and blessings of Allah be upon him commanded us to fulfill the rights of the women and others who are. We, the wives of Prophet Muhammad report that he never hit any of them. In the pre-Islamic period of ignorance women never used to receive any share in the estate. The deceased's eldest son or the brother used to take the entire estate. Islam, however, rectified the situation and gave women also a share. In addition Ali did not just say, give them also a share. Instead he even stipulated how much should be given to them. More so he also commanded that they receive their shares first. After they receive their shares, the rest is distributed among those heirs who used to receive shares even prior to Islam for example son, father, grandfather, brother, uncle, etc. from the twelve types of people who inherit from the deceased, two-thirds that is eight are women viz. Wife, mother, granddaughter, sister, consanguine sister, uterine sister, maternal grandmother and paternal grandmother. From them the daughter, wife and mother receive shares in all conditions. In view of the fact that Islam does not burden women with any financial obligations, their expenses are therefore the responsibility of the men that is their fathers, husband, sons and brothers. Hence it is only appropriate that the share of the son should exceed the share of the daughter. For example a man died leaving behind his wife, daughter, mother and son. Thus his wife will receive 12, 5%, his mother will receive 16, 66%, his daughter will receive 23, 62% and his son will receive 47.22%. As a result of supporting his sister, mother and grandmother, the son's wealth will definitely decrease. However, in all probability, the wealth of the three women will not decrease. Later the son will have to spend his money when getting his sister married. When the sister gets married, her husband will have to provide her with ma and all other household necessities. However, when the son gets married, he will have to pay ma and provide for the household necessities all from his money. In short, while the daughter's wealth increased instead of decreasing, the son's wealth is decreasing all the time. The above are brief answers to doubts that non-Muslims have regarding the status of women in Islam. 2. It should firstly be understood that Islam is a heavenly religion. Its aim is that all types of people in all places and times practice on its teachings and gain success in this world and the hereafter. Thus it teaches belief, morals, worship, social relationship with others etc. Similarly its teachings are not confined to any time, place and group of people. By means of such teachings Islam aims at rectifying man's thinking, character and morals. So that he will not behave like an animal, instead he will benefit the rest of humankind and the other creations of Allah. The moral, 
social, civil and political conditions of the Arabs were pathetic at the time of Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings of Allah be upon him appearance in the world. At that time the Romans and the Persians were on the rise. However, although they had some sort of a civil and political system, their moral situation was equally bad. The weak and destitute were oppressed. The whole of humanity had forgotten their creator. They had no realization at all of life after death. They regarded this worldly life as everything. Thus they adopted any method they desired to attain success in this world. Consequently the stronger class was dominant despite being few in number. They had enslaved the rest of the people. The kings, rulers and governors enjoyed all forms of comfort while the poor were deprived of basic necessities. The masses were duty bound to please their rulers and provide them with every possible form of comfort. Allah Power Allah sent his prophet Muhammad peace and blessings of Allah be upon him in such a dark, frightening and oppressive situation. He then revealed his book the Quran to him and commanded him to propagate his message in all the Arabian territories. With the help of Allah he complied, until after only 23 years and very little monetary expense and loss of human life. The revolutionary teachings of Allah and the excellent ways of his prophet peace and blessings of Allah be upon him eventually produced such a pious nation whose sole objective was to please the Creator, to help the rest of humankind and the other creations of Allah and to prepare for the hereafter. The whole world knows what chaos is unleashed by invading force when they invade a country. However, when Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings of Allah be upon him conquered Maker, the wife of the leader of Maker commented that, I thought that they would drink a huge amount of liquor at might and destroy the honor of many women. However, I saw the total opposite. Never before was Allah worshipped as much as he was on this night. Neither was any woman's honor destroyed nor was anybody's wealth looted. In fact the conquered people spent the night peacefully. In 23 years Prophet Muhammad prepared such a group of followers who established a civilized and just government and society in the Arabian Peninsula. This group of followers thereafter disposed of the oppressive rulers of Iran, Iraq, Egypt and Syria etc. and freed the masses from the tyranny. When entering such territories the mission of the Sahaba was that we have come to rescue man from servitude of man to servitude of Allah. To take man from the oppression of all religions to the justice of Islam. To remove man from the narrowness of the dunya to the vastness of the hereafter. All of this is mentioned in the books of history. Unfortunately we cannot go into much detail now. The aim of the teachings of Islam is to rectify man's thinking so that he can be beneficial to mankind. Islam's aim is to free man from all superstitions and base his level of understanding and then bless him with such things that all the treasures and everything of the dunya will be at his service. So that he himself will then serve the Creator. When man possesses that level of thinking, he will utilize his intellect and advance the bounties and natural resources of the world. He will invent new things in order to make life easier and more comfortable. Hence, after the appearance of Islam, when non-Muslim rule of Iraq, Iran etc. was ended and Byzantine rule was limited to Rome only, the study of secular sciences also stagnated. At that time Muslim scholars and leaders played a crucial role in the development and promotion of these sciences. Greek textbooks were translated into Arabic and then taught to the students. The Muslims promoted every subject opening the doors of knowledge for everyone. Gradually these subjects entered Europe through Muslim Spain. Till today there are many Arabic words in many subjects that bear testimony to this. If you read this section on the Middle Ages in the encyclopedia you will see how low the academic, moral, civil and political situation in Europe was at that time. On the other hand, what was the condition of the Muslim world? How did the ancient philosophy of Socrates and Pluto etc. reach Europe although it was not in English, French or German? The amount of freedom Islam gave for utilizing, understanding and promoting of worldly bounties was not given by any other religion. Due to these freedom Muslim leaders, scholars and thinkers promoted the study of secular sciences and breathed life to the ancient Greek subjects. The current decadence of Muslims all over the world is not due to Islam and its teachings. Instead it is due to not practicing on the teachings of Islam and their leaders being overawed by others. Finally we request you to view Muslims from this angle and to remedy their weaknesses. We have drawn your attention to view aspects in order to answer your question. You will be able to answer the objections of non-Muslims in the light of what we have written above and further reading. Analatara knows best. Mufti Muhammad Ashraf.